for those of you who just got on, we're, we're just waiting a few minutes until we get uh, most people signed on and then we'll get started. I think we'll wait maybe one more minute and then we can get started. Okay, why don't we start? I I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's lecture. My name is Sister Damian Marie Savino, and I'm the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas College. And we're delighted to welcome you to the Your Health lecture this year. We usually do it in person, but in a way, it's almost better we can reach people far and near with, with doing it on Zoom like this. And uh, the Aquinas College and the MSU College of Human Medicine have for quite a few years now had an early assurance agreement dedicated to opening pathways for Aquinas graduates to enter medical school. The Your Health Lecture is part of that partnership. At Aquinas, we're pleased to co-sponsor this lecture with the MSU College of Human Medicine and Mercy Health St. Mary's. And I'd like to thank Nikki uh, Lechner and Mark Riev and the MSU College of Human Medicine for their assistance in planning the lecture and for those at Aquinas who helped promote the lecture. For almost a year now, it's hard to believe, <laughs> we've all been suffering together through the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a lot to learn and reflect on in relation to the pandemic. And as difficult as it has been, and more difficult for some than for others, there is an opportunity in the crisis, an opportunity to come out of it as better people. So for this year, I thought a talk on the pandemic would be an appropriate topic for the Your Health Lecture. We hope the lecture gives us some space, the space we need to deepen our understanding of the pandemic and to begin some reflections on its meaning for our lives and for the future. We were then delighted to find Dr. Clements, who is an Aquinas biology alum and now assistant professor in the Master of Public Health program in the MSU College of Medicine. And we're really grateful for his willingness to be our, our speaker this evening. You can see the title of his talk, Plagues, Pestilence, and Pandemics, Historical Responses and Future Impacts. Dr. Clements will reflect on COVID-19 responses in West Michigan, the impacts of social determinants of health on COVID-19 outcomes in Michigan, along with some of the short-term and potential long-term societal impacts of COVID-19. A little bit on his background, he earned his BS in biology from Aquinas College in 1989, then completed graduate studies in bioresource engineering at Oregon State University, and a master's in public administration from Grand Valley State University. He went on at GVSU for a PhD in sociology and environmental science and policy. 
In his role in the Master of Public Health program at MSU, Dr. Clements conducts health outcomes and health services research. His most recent research focuses on the association of social determinants of health, such as race, ethnicity, rural residency, income, et cetera, and multiple chronic health conditions on health outcomes in Michigan Medicare beneficiaries with type two diabetes. Dr. Clements teaches biostatistics, a research methodology course, and a course about global pandemics for the MPH program at MSU. We welcome you very warmly, Dr. Clements, and look forward to your presentation. We hope to have time at the end for a few questions. So if you could please write them in the Q&A, we'll moderate that at the end of Dr. Clements' talk. So thank you very much, Dr. Clements, and welcome you have the stage. <laughs> Thanks, Sister Damien. I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, just one little correction. It's, uh, uh, my PhD is from Michigan State. So just, just in case oh. there's anyone there, I, I want to make sure they know that, that I got it from there. Um, so sorry. No, no, that's okay. So, but I, I really want to thank Aquinas and, well, you know, first of all, for a great education. I loved my time there, but um, for Aquinas for sponsoring this as well as uh, Mercy Health and, and also uh, Michigan State. So happy to be here. Um, I won't talk about myself. You heard enough. I, you know, Sister Damien said I, I teach a lot of stuff. I just had one sort of funny thing, you know, I, I teach biostatistics and I think if my biostats professor from Aquinas was on the line right now, he'd probably double over in laughter because, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, that was something. Um, but here I am, you know, however many years later teaching that. So uh, things are going pretty well. Um, I'll get started with the presentation. And like Sister Damien said, there's a, a Q&A function uh, that you can put questions in. And, and I'm happy to answer anything if I can. So um, agenda. So really, I'm going to talk a little bit about past pandemics. Um, I think it's important when we think about what's going on right now that we can actually learn from our past, right? There are things that have happened, and, and we can take some lessons from that. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, talk about social determinants of health, and there may be people on the line or on the on the webinar that don't know what those are, and so I'm going to introduce that and talk a little bit about what that looks like in Michigan, and then uh, you know talk a little bit about some short-term and potential long-term impacts to this. Uh, we see things that are happening right now that are probably going to go on for a long time, and uh, my opinion is is we need to take those seriously and, and make sure that we're planning for those types of things. So that's what we'll get into today. So uh, let's start with Black Death. Um, you know, no better way to start a conversation, right, than talk about bubonic plague. Uh, you know, throughout the uh, really 1300s, mid 1300s is when this sort of came into prevalence um, in Europe. Uh, here's a, an Italian poet who writes about some of the symptoms and, you know, they, they must have had a, 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 a something they were missing when they had to write poetry about bubonic plague. Uh, but anyway, it talks about some of the uh, symptoms and what goes on there. We know now that our bites from rat fleas. And so, you know, we, we know what it comes from and how to cure it. Uh, this is what a doctor, so this was called a doctor mask, right, in 1340s and 1350s um, and even later. But you can see this is a physician going to treat people with bubonic plague. And you can see PPE, right, personal protective equipment. So they've got a long gown on, they've got gloves. Uh, they have got a hat covering their hair, covering their head, and they have this mask on. And so it looks like a bird's beak, but within the mask, they would put things like herbs, um, you know, herbal remedies, they would put honey, they would put all sorts of things. And they thought that by breathing in through the mask, it would sort of um, stop them from getting sick. So first real efforts at PPE, right? And we see today, we're still using PPE, we still have masks, we still have different things that we need to do to protect ourselves. Um, mid 1300s is when this really hit. I like to think about things like, you know, medical humanities and art and writing and the things that were going on at the time. And so this image is from a, a history book a little later on, but it's uh, people in a village that are bringing their coffins of, you know, friends, family, loved ones to be buried. Okay, so, and the coffins really never stopped coming. This was happening all over the place. Uh, the first big breakout was in Sicily in 1347, came from ships. And if you know anything about ships, probably in medieval times, close quarters infested with rats. And of course, they all had fleas. And so sailors disembark and they, you know, run rampant over Sicily doing whatever sailors do. And uh, boom, bubonic plague, right? So this is how it all started. Uh, there is some thought that, you know, bubonic plague has been around for a long time and maybe really originated in Asia. 
but they're, uh, you know, researchers, anthropologists are finding evidence of this maybe in Europe as far back as, you know, 3000 BC. So uh, there, there's questions about when it really came, but we know that the first big outbreaks were in, in Europe in the 1300s. So a lot of the reactions at the time was because uh, people didn't know how disease was transmitted. And so this was viewed as a punishment from God, right? And so the image here from, uh, uh, I don't know how to say his name in French, but um, basically it's the residents of the town burning Jews um, because they were blamed for the bubonic plague. Uh, we can think to what's happening now with COVID-19 and I'm not sure of the evidence, but there's a lot of claims lately that some anti-Asian American violence that's going on right now could be related to COVID-19 because of the thoughts of where it originated from. So it seems as though even, you know, 700, almost 700 years past that we're still interested in finding blame for what's going on, okay? Um, but this is, you know, something that happened. So thousands of Jews massacred in 1348-49 um, all over Europe. But a lot of the other reactions that we see are still the same too, right? So healthy people are isolating themselves. Doctors are stopping seeing patients. So remember at the beginning of the pandemic, um, if it wasn't uh, a, a, a elective services were sort of stopped, at least in the state of Michigan. Um, markets closed, stores closed, people left cities for country, right? So I, I live in a rural area of Michigan. Um, and we found at the beginning of the pandemic, people from downstate, from Detroit, Grand Rapids, um, Chicago area, they were coming to their second homes here. So uh, they were interested in leaving the city and just getting out in the country. So a lot of it sounds vaguely familiar to what our experiences are right now. Uh, outbreaks in later years. And so I think uh, the thing I want to highlight here is that uh, we have things that happened, again, six or 700 years ago that inform what we do today. So later years in the city of Ragusa, um, the city stopped sailors from disembarking until they could monitor them for disease. And so initially they held them for 30 days, called a Trentino. Later it increased to 40 days, called a Quarantino, right? So quarantine, this is where we get it from. Um, the outbreaks in later years were also the start of contact tracing beginnings. And so you came in on a ship and you had to tell where you were and who you've been in contact with or if you're infected in a city or in a location, they asked you, who have you been in contact with? Where have you been? And so these were the ideas of beginning to trace where people were getting infected so that they, get, so that they could control the spread of disease. So the point I wanna make about this is that we have very well-established public health tools that can help us reduce the spread of infectious disease. And so the fact that we're using them six or 700 years later should be no surprise because they do work. Um, of course, you know, in the society we live in now, there are hesitancies about using these things. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff later, but um, we know they work. And so that's why we continue to use them, okay? Let's see, I wanna, I'm looking at notes. I wanna make sure I got everything. So next, let's move on from bubonic, bubonic plague to Spanish flu, right? Another great thing to talk about. Um, but really what I wanna highlight here is what's in a name, right? So there's lots of controversy over what we call um, uh, the coronavirus, right? So SARS-CoV-2, lots of controversy. Um, it's called different things by different people, um, but it doesn't really help us understand sort of what it is, right, and, and where it's from and how it started and all of that sort of stuff. It doesn't refer to a biological or chemical, um, you know, structure or makeup of a, of a virus. Um, so there's some danger in this, right? So Spanish flu probably did not originate in Spain, right? Um, what we find is that during World War I, Spain was neutral. Their media was free. They had a free press. They could publish what they wanted. And of course, there were flu cases during the time. And so they would write about it, publish it, talk about the trials and tribulations. And so it automatically became associated with Spain. But because of World War I censorship, media, government, armed forces, they didn't want to let other countries know that their troops were sick and that their people were sick. And so they didn't allow that information to be printed. And so, frankly, there's lots of debate over where Spanish flu originated. Um, a couple of the most prevalent things that are coming out now that have good evidence for them are that it's possible that Chinese laborers who were sort of recruited from China to work on the Western Front in Europe during the war um, they were shipped across Canada in train cars, sealed up, they spread disease, they were quarantined. And as you can see, um, just like today, they're um, branded in, in different ways, right? 
Um, but this is one idea of where these things might have happened. Another one that really has some great evidence is that maybe the Spanish flu originated in Kansas, right? So this is a US problem. Um, and, and the evidence that we have for that is that there were some uh, um, uh, armed force bases in Kansas and elsewhere where uh, 48 soldiers died of flu right before the big outbreak in 1918. And so these soldiers at these uh, military bases were sent overseas. And so maybe that's how things spread too. Uh, but the idea here is that it, it, it usually isn't as simple as saying that it came from one place caused by one thing. There, there are likely to be uh, lots of studies done in the future about what's going on now to really narrow down how this happened. I mean, there's some pretty good information, um, but they're still studying it. And so even 100 years after Spanish flu, we're still trying to figure out exactly where it came from and how it spread. Um, a thing I want to highlight here is a few things. So we can see the pictures here um, on the left side of the screen if we talk about the St. Louis Today newspaper. What are the headlines? Closing schools, closing theaters, you know, preventing public gatherings. 100 years later doing the same thing. Uh, the, the picture on the right side of the screen there are kids that are getting ready to go to school and what do they have on? They have masks on, right? So again, 600 years ago, we're quarantining, we're contact tracing. 100 years ago, we're closing things and we are using masks to prevent the spread of disease, okay? We know these things work in many situations. I'm not trying to discount the idea that by shutting things down, you know, I mean, we are harming the economy. We are harming social relationships. We are, you know, doing all of these things that are going to have a lasting impact. But as far as preventing the spread of disease, we have public health tools that work. And so look at this, life expectancy from the Spanish flu within a couple of years reduced life expectancy in the US by 12 years. So in 1918, it's not like people were living a long time to begin with, right? If you were born in the 1900, early 1900s, you lived about 50 years. Um, but the Spanish flu reduced that very quickly to about 39 years. Now, the way they calculate life expectancy is a little strange. It's not like people only live 39 years, but at that moment in time, for that couple, you know, year period of time, life expectancy reduced to 39 years. As the pandemic went away, as, you know, it, it sort of no longer had an effect, life expectancy bounces back. But we see that what's happening right now with COVID-19, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Again, another thing I want to note here is, again, the, the newspaper things, the pictures that we have right here. Uh, what we have is from the Seattle Daily Times, the headline, churches, schools, shows closed. And here we have a streetcar um, operator in Seattle that's denying service to an unmasked man. So um, right here, we can see the streetcar operator. He has a mask on. The guy's friend has a mask on. This guy does not, and he's not being allowed to go on there. So um, again, we see you know the same thing going on today, where in the state of Michigan, at least, um, you know, store operators and other business operators are, are required to make sure that people are wearing masks. Um, whether different localities make sure that happens or not is another story. Uh, but again, we see the same things happening. So the recommendations at the time, very familiar to what's happening right now, right? Avoid crowded places, wear masks, don't shake hands, close schools and theaters. And we even have some unscientific advice, right? So this is not a, 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 a you know, a surprise that unscientific remedies were being used. Um, and they're used for all sorts of things as we go through time, right? So we've got the snake oil salesman, we've got all that stuff going on. But the advice here was to eat cinnamon, drink wine, you know, which frankly doesn't sound like a bad idea, um, especially if you've been locked inside for a year. But, you know, drinking wine to cure, mints to cure, that type of stuff. So uh, we know that that really doesn't work to cure the flu. Um, and then the thing we had, right, an unconcerned public demonstrations against public health recommendations 100 years ago, same thing happening today. Right, so um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. This, the, none of this is a surprise that's happening today because it happened 100 years ago, it happened 600 years ago. These are all things that, you know, that, that just continue to go on. Lasting effects. So we'll talk a little bit about what's gonna happen with COVID-19, but there's some very good research out about Spanish flu and what has happened since then to people that lived through it. So immediately there were labor shortages and wage increases. So labor shortages because people weren't working, they were dying. Um, and then this happened at a time during World War I when men went off to war, right? And so during that time, women were not working outside the house. Labor shortages and in order to get people to work, wage increases. So some of those immediate things happened. Um, short term, midterm, and even longer term, we saw increased use of social safety nets. So food banks, housing, that type of stuff. 
Um, some really good research that's come out in the last few years is looking at flu-borne cohorts. So people that were born from 1918 to 1920. And what we find with them is they had lower educational attainment, more disability, more health problems, lower lifetime income, lower socioeconomic status. These are not things that are conjecture, right? This is not a theory, this is measured. And this is what happened to people that were born during that time. So they weren't even people, they weren't even, you know, born yet. They were still, you know, waiting to come out, right? But before that even happened, their lifetime was gonna be affected by this. And so we need to start thinking in terms of what's gonna to happen to people right now, you know, who are pregnant, who are being born, who are gonna to have to live with this just starting out, okay? And this is my point of being able to learn from what's happened in the past. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Next thing, SARS. So SARS was not a huge thing, severe acute respiratory syndrome. So you'll recognize if you've been reading about, you know, the current coronavirus, um, it is a SARS type of thing, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, SARS, the original SARS was um, caused by a coronavirus and it was first reported in Asia, right? So wasn't a huge thing, right? Only 8,000 people infected, 774 died. And I say only as though, you know, it doesn't matter, but these are people and these are deaths, right? So this does matter. But compared to what's going on right now and what's happened with other epidemics and pandemics, um, it, you know, really low impact. But the thing that this did um, combined with MERS, which I don't talk about, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, um, is it informed reactions for future, right? And so we can look at our map here and see, okay, look, China had a, you know, 5,300 cases, 349 deaths, Hong Kong, um, South Korea only had a few cases, Philippines a little bit, Singapore, there were a bunch in the US a little bit and a bunch in Canada. Um, but what this likely did is the experience with it coming out of Asia, moving into these, uh, you know, island countries or other countries in Asia, is that it informed them what they needed to do for future outbreaks, okay? And what we'll see is that they likely followed through on that, okay? So I'll talk a little bit about that. But that's the big thing I wanted to get out about that. Next thing, H1N1, uh, influenza A, also called swine flu. There's this idea that, you know, there's connection with pigs and it, you know, jumped and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's H1N1. Um, it emerged in early April 2009 in, in Mexico. The first case was in April in the U.S. And it spread very quickly. So just like the novel coronavirus that we have now, very little immunity. Um, and But by the time November came around of that same year, we had vaccines approved, we were ready to go. Um, there's some idea that there was immunity in older people because the, or the virus is related to the Spanish flu virus. And so they had some immunity to that. And so older people were not as greatly affected. Um, but we had, you know, a lot of stuff going on, 60 million cases in the U.S., 12,000 deaths. Um, it's estimated that, a, you know, anywhere from 150 to 575,000 died worldwide. Um, there are other estimates that say that about 25% of the world population at the time, so probably we're 2009, we're probably at 6 million, 5 million, um, but about 25% of that of the population of the world was infected by H1N1. Um, so, this was sort of a thing that emerged on our side of the world, right? And so it's important to think about, well, how did that affect what happened, right? So April 15th, first case detected in the US. Between April 15th and April 29th, lots of things happened. So CDC worked on contact tracing and on with animal and human health officials. And within 14 days, they did that. They developed a candidate vaccine virus. So they created a vaccine so that they could use it as um, or, or a virus to use as in vaccine production. They activated emergency operations. They uploaded gene sequences within nine days, right? They declared a public health emergency or the who, who did. They released PPE stockpile and they implemented the pandemic response plan and declared a public health emergency all within 14 days, right? So very active at the beginning. Um, who later declared a pandemic? Um, in October, the U.S. declared a national emergency, which is a little different from a public health emergency. And there's a lot of criticism at the time that, that this was too late. Um, the idea behind a national emergency is that it allows um, for the use of industry, right? So the forced use of industry to create products and things to use in, a, in, a, in an emergency. 
Um, again, lots of lots of um, give and take and back and forth about whether it was too late or not. Uh, but the public health emergency allowed for the activation of the public health infrastructure in the United States to deal with the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Okay. So what happened as far as testing and vaccine goes? So by April 28th, right, less than two weeks after our first case, there was emergency use authorization of a real-time PCR test, polymerization chain reaction test. Um, that detects DNA or RNA of the virus. Two weeks to do that. Um, by May 1st, um, the CDC shipped test kits for over a million tests to 140 countries, well, internationally and then domestically. Um, CDC worked with countries in the Southern and Northern Hemisphere during their flu seasons to address testing and monitoring. And by September, they approved um, four H1N1 vaccines and another on November 16th. So a lot of the pushback that we hear about the vaccine today is that it was developed too quickly, right? Here are vaccines developed within from April to November, let's say six months. Yeah, six months. Now the flu vaccine had been around for a long time and so they can adapt it and use a new flu virus, but six months to get a vaccine out for this. Um, there was a lot of criticism at the time, especially after September, because there was a slow rollout of vaccines. It didn't happen quickly. Again, we can notice this today, um, but uh, so, you know, people expected it to happen quickly. By the time a fifth vaccine was approved in November, you know, production had ramped up and they were able to get vaccines widely distributed. But there was a lot of criticism of the, of the federal administration at the time for the slow rollout, okay? So why the different response? And there's lots of things that we can think about here, but one, it quickly emerged in the US, right? It was in our back door, it was in our country, it wasn't on the other side of the world, and we weren't really thinking in terms of, eh, it's not gonna happen here, right? Everything will be okay. The other reason I think personally is that it affected young people, right? So 87% of the deaths were under 65 years of age, meaning that working age people and young people were dying from this, right? 34% um, of people that are hospitalized were under the age of 18. The risk of hospitalization was four to seven times greater for young people than with the seasonal flu. And the risk of death was eight to, time, eight to 12 times greater than the seasonal flu, okay? So I think that if COVID had emerged differently in this country, we may have been looking at it differently. And I also think that um, one, if different age groups had been impacted by COVID differently, and different demographic groups had been impacted differently, we might be looking at this differently. In the early days of COVID, um, black and brown people had case rates of about four to one and were dying at, a case, at, at rates of four to one um, compared to whites. Um, I think personally, and I, I don't have data to show this very much, um, but I'd love to, to figure out how to do the research to see if that's the case. We know that with other infectious diseases um, and, and other uh, you know, public health epidemics and emergencies that um, this can be the case. So with HIV, it was largely ignored because it was a gay man's problem, right? We, we know that that's what happened. So until it started moving into other populations, it was something that we could ignore. Um, it was very easy to do that. There's some evidence to suggest that with the opioid epidemic, early days of the opioid epidemic were inner city black and brown folks that were dying and addicted and dying from this. The way that the, when, the, when the federal government and state governments decided to really take this seriously and, and put resources to the problem is when suburban moms and kids started dying from opioids. So there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that maybe this could have been looked at differently if a different population had been impacted in the early days which is unfortunate. Uh, again, I'd love to be able to do a research study to try and show this. I don't have the data to say it, I'm just hypothesizing. Um, but different times in administrations, right? So H1N1, Obama administration, COVID-19, Trump administration, uh, there's lots of questions sort of going about, well, they did this wrong, they did this right, who did what, right? Um, but the, the question really with COVID-19, was there a lack of federal government response for COVID-19? Could things have been done differently? Um, the idea right now is that science and public health are very politicized. Over the last 20, 30 years, two, three decades, this was, this was part of my main research when I was doing my doctoral program, and I still look at it a little bit, um, is that science, science is very politicized. So the products of science, the way it's done, are twisted and skewed to show what people want them to show. Um, conflicting guidelines from the early pandemic to now, 
uh, there's a lot of reluctance to take into account that knowledge changes as we learn more. There's questions about travel and border restrictions. <clears throat> Excuse me, are they effective? Was it too soon, too late? And then I think we have to talk about Operation Warp Speed, which is, um, has been a very fruitful program, right? So pro vaccines have been developed because of this and they're, <clears throat> excuse me, rolling out right now. So I think it's important that we acknowledge that, you know what, when we go back two years, five years, 10 years, and we're ahead then and we look back, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? There are things that happened in the last year that we have to acknowledge were good, right? There were good things that came out of it, but there are things that we have to acknowledge were not so good. And we'll learn more about that. But my point is, is that this should influence how we do things in the future. And the past are things that we can learn from moving forward, okay? So let's talk about COVID. I'm not going to go on too much about this slide, but uh, the, the name of it is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. So you'll see it abbreviated SARS-CoV-2. The disease is called COVID-19, Coronavirus Disease 19. We know it emerged in China. It moved to countries outside of China very early in the pandemic, moved to the U.S. Um, there's really good evidence coming out right now, especially since World Health Organization, you know, visited China, uh, got some more data. It looks like this was probably spreading in the community earlier than December and probably in the United States earlier than January. So again, as we learn more, this is what we find out. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is, uh, is behavior, right, and acceptance of science and, and what makes people sort of do these things. Um, in early March, I, I did some studies related to um, knowledge about COVID-19, behaviors, adherence to recommendations, uh, but, you know, this is not a surprise for the U.S. So CDC and NIH say, you know, limit your social contacts. So we close universities and kids go to bars in spring break, right? And uh, it's not just kids, it's not just, you know, Gen Y and millennials. We found out that some of the baby boomers are doing the same thing, right? They're going to bingo, they're doing whatever. Um, they encouraged wise use of medical supplies, including masks. So what did we do? We hoarded medical grade masks, right? Now, this is where I talk about changing knowledge. In March, we were saying, yeah, you know what? You probably shouldn't be wearing masks. Um, we need medical providers to use these. And very, very soon thereafter, you know, certainly by summer, um, the knowledge was there, the, the research was there, the peer review papers were there that said, yeah, these can reduce the transmission of disease. It's not gonna be like an N95 mask, but if we can, if we can reduce even 30%, hey, that's pretty good, right? So we should start wearing masks. Um, and then they assured the public about the reliability of food and consumable supplies. So what did we do? We bought all the toilet paper we could uh, we bought eggs and froze them. We bought milk and froze them. And, you know, paper towels were gone. You can't find bleach. Um, so that's what we did, right? We're told to do one thing and we do a completely different thing. Uh, you know, that's, that's who we are. Um, so let's look at COVID cases. And you'll see that there's some dates here. And the reason the dates are important is for no other reason than I was doing some research and work around these dates. So in mid-March, I, uh, I did a national survey again about um, knowledge about COVID-19, behaviors, adherence to recommendations. So I, I know the numbers of cases at that time. Um, in mid-July, I was doing a presentation for a, another group of people. So I have those numbers. Um, in uh, November, I was doing a presentation for one of my classes. So I have that information. And then you can see today, 225.20, we are at 28, 000, 28 million cases in the US and 505,000 deaths. Um, the important thing I want you to get out of here is that, you know, first of all, these are people, right? Um, and, and people are, people have this, people are dying. Not are, there many, most people recover. So I, I'm not going to gloss that over. But <clears throat> in the U.S., we have 4% of the population of the world. We account for 25% of COVID cases and 20% of COVID deaths. 4% of the population. So let that sink in a minute, right? It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make sense. How could we have done better? And we'll talk a little bit about that. So pandemic preparedness, um, Global Health Security Index, Johns Hopkins in October, 2019, got together with experts all over the world and they ranked each country about their global health security and how prepared they were for um, spreading diseases, right? US was ranked overall number one for preparedness. We had a score of about 83 out of 100. Overall, the US and everyone else was rated as pretty weak. The average score for all of the countries on earth was 40. 
but we were ranked number one in five out of six areas. So prevention of the and the emergence uh, prevention of the emergence and release of pathogens, early detection, rapid response, robust health systems, commitment to improving national capacity, ranked at number one. Now our scores range somewhere from you know mid 70s up to mid 90s, so somewhere in there. We were ranked number 19th in the sixth area, which is overall risk environment and country vulnerability to biological threats. I feel like they combined these two things together because they just didn't want to put a seventh area in because the risk environment is very different from our vulnerability to biological threats. And the risk environment that they highlighted, <clears throat> excuse me, in their report and talked about was related to political insecurity, social unrest, unrest and public health vulnerabilities. We were rated number one in all of those five areas, number one. And the thing that took us down was our political divide, our social unrest, and the way people view public health. Social, cultural, political, um, uh, political characteristics that completely overran our ability to prevent, detect, respond, right, everything. So it was the perfect storm for us, right? No one could look at 2020 and say there wasn't political unrest, there wasn't social unrest, and that public health and uh, the science behind public health was, was not being attacked in some way, shape, or form. So um, we need to address this, right? So we have work to do in all the areas. Every country has work to do in all the areas. But if we can't get our um, social and cultural issues figured out in a way that we're moving forward together, none of this other stuff at the beginning is going gonna, is gonna to matter at all, OK? So I wanted to point that out. We were ranked number one. It was trotted out, you know, early in the pandemic. Hey, we're number one. We're number one. We're going to do great. We didn't do so great. Okay. So what's happening elsewhere? This is what's happened in the U.S. So or um, worldwide so far. As of today, we have about 112 million cases. And I presented a couple ways of looking at this, right? So on the left, we have what's considered a normal scale. And on the right, we have considered a logarithmic scale. So when you have an infectious disease or something else, and you just want to know the numbers of cases, you add up the number you have on every day and add it to the previous days, right? And so you get a cumulative count here, right? So here we go up, we're at 50 million, somewhere around November and 100 million and so on and so forth. But infectious disease like COVID doesn't spread on a normal way. It spreads exponentially. So for every one person that has COVID-19, they can infect two or three others. So one person can infect two, two will infect four, four will infect eight, 16, 32, 64. And I'm not gonna continue to do the math, right? Um, if it infects three, right? One to three to nine to 27 to whatever, right? And so that's called, that's exponential. And so with a logarithmic scale, we can see that exponential growth a little better. So we can see very quickly in the early days of the pandemic, boom, we were at 100,000 cases worldwide pretty quickly. And then the world shut down, right? People took it seriously. They were worried, scared, didn't know what was going to happen. And so really government shut down all over the world. And we can see this flattening curve right here, right? So not very many new cases were added. And then, well, people are sick of being locked down. Government, politicians, administrators are saying, man, our economy's tanking. People are worried. People are socially isolated. We need to do something different. And so they opened. And so then we get exponential growth again. And we can see since then that we've just been expanding and expanding and expanding. So it adds and adds and adds. What we're looking for is at some point, this, this will flatten out considerably, okay? And so when I present some of this information, these, these are the types of scales we'll look at. So let's look at what happens in the US and South Korea. These are not meant to be complete comparisons, but there are, you can note some differences here, right? So um, when we talk about cases, Right now, about 8.5% of the population has been infected. And that's based on the data that we have, right? There might be some missing data. There might be some mistakes. There might be all that sort of stuff. But based on the data we have, that's what we have. That equates to a case rate of 85,000 cases per million people. So if we had a million people in the US and we just picked out at random, we'd expect we'd find 85,000 cases of COVID-19, OK? Um, our fatality rate has decreased from about 4% to about 1.7%. And you'll see with the rest of the countries that I talk about that we're at about 1.5%, 2%. And that might be where we settle in as far as the fatality rate goes. But in the US, here's what happened. We have a large population, little centralized response. We have strong states' rights, highly politicized science, and low trust in science, and no trust in government right? You're not going to tell us what to do. 
and that's what's happened, right? So this, these are this is why we have this many cases. South Korea. So I talked about South Korea before a little bit in their experience with SARS. Uh, what we have here is a case rate of about 1,600 cases per million. So the U.S. case rate per million is about 50 times greater than in South Korea. 88,000 cases as of February. Now the population in South Korea is about 55 million, but there are only about 0.17% of the population infected. Here is the big difference. So they had an early swift strict response. The rest of it's really important, but the biggest thing that happened in South Korea is that within a couple weeks of cases being identified in China, they pulled together their biotech people, their IT people, their diagnostic test um, uh, developers and researchers. Everybody flew in from South Korea to a centralized airport and the government came in and they said, here's a ton of money you go and develop diagnostic tests, go and develop tracing systems, go and develop the IT stuff that we need in order to get this under control. And in return, you have all this money. And what we're going to do for you is by the time you're done and ready to go, we'll approve it quickly if it all makes sense. And that's what they did. And so they were able to contact trace. They were able to um, test thousands of people a day. And they offered their testing stuff to us. And we said, eh, no, we don't need that, right? We'll use the CDC stuff, which wasn't developed at all. Um, and we know that now. Um, so they had this response in place immediately. And it's directly related <clears throat> to their experience with SARS and MERS, right? So it didn't have a huge impact in their country, but they knew based on what was happening around them that if it hit them, there was going to be big trouble. And so they took it seriously when um, COVID-19 hit. And that's one of the reasons we see today that they haven't really had you know, a huge impact in their country. Now, clearly, right, people are getting it, people are dying, there's an issue there, but very, very quickly under control. Let's look at Sweden and Norway, because who doesn't want to look at Northern Europe, right? So these places are trotted out as the places that we should be like, as far as, you know, um, uh, federal health care, nationalized health care, they've got it all together. And in some cases, they do, we can't argue with that. But in Sweden, right, Sweden and Norway, two very similar countries, um, demographically, pretty homogeneous. People are, you know, generally the same. They're all blonde and pretty. And, um, you know, but they had centralized responses, high trust in government, high trust in science, and people will do what their government tells them to do. In Sweden, they said, eh, no lockdowns, no quarantines, no closures, or very few. They made recommendations. Um, but overall, no centralized lockdowns of the country. In Norway, they said, yeah, we're going to lock down. And so here's what happens, right? So um, again, not, you know, I mean, these are huge numbers of cases. So about 6.4% of Sweden's population has it, but their fatality rate's about 1.9. And when it started out, it was about 7.2%. Uh, in Norway, we're at about 2.8% fatality rate at the beginning, but about 0.8% right now. So doing far better than probably the average of about 1.5, okay? So a little different. Um, last one is to look at India and New Zealand. The important thing I want to point out about India, huge population, their case rate's about 8,000 cases per million. Um, we, we look at sometimes how fast the disease is spreading and we look to see how long it takes to double the number of cases. Um, India has been at about 10 to 11 million cases for about the last 60 to 80 days. Um, in the US, we went from 10 million cases to 20 million cases within the span of a few days, okay? They have been there for hundreds of days, right? And, and it doesn't seem as though uh, they're increasing very much anymore. And there's lots of questions as to why. But um, this is something that's happened there. It's slowed, slowed way down, way down. Um, so those are some questions about that. And then New Zealand is the thing that everyone trots out when they want to say that it can be controlled. Um, I, don't, I don't dispute that. It can be controlled. Um, the thing about New Zealand is they have sea borders. They're an island, right? So they have flights and ships. It's the only way you can get there. Um, and they had really high trust in government, high trust in science. They believed their prime minister, I think, or president, um, when, they, when she said, hey, this is what we have to do. And people did it. Now, people complain about it. There are, some, there are people out there that are complaining about it. But overall, you know, very successful. I, I, uh, I you know, whatever. I watched cricket a, a few weeks ago um, that came live from New Zealand. And full sports stadiums, people out, hanging out, beautiful sunny day. Um, and so that, you know, that's what they wanted and, and that's what the, the, uh, their society is willing to do, okay? 
So Michigan, um, the, the reason I have the red lines here is that I was looking at some of this data in July, right? And so you can see from the red lines that the red lines indicate where in, where on the curves these were, okay? So you can see, you know, in July or yeah, in July we were, oh my gosh, look at how much this is increasing, what an increase. And when we put it over the whole data, we see, oh, that's just a little blip, right? And then boom, it increases. Um, when we look at the number of daily cases, so this was March through July 15th, this is what we're really talking about here, a tiny little first wave, right? And then boom, the rest of it, we have a second wave. And so these are the things that we need to look at, but very concerned here, not so concerned here anymore, right? People don't wanna stay home, they don't wanna do things. Um, people more willing to follow things in their early days. We know from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we know from the Spanish flu epidemic or pandemic that there were specific waves. So they had a spring wave, huh. They had a fall wave, oh, look at that. And they had a winter wave. Ours are sort of probably together. And then they had a wave a couple years later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we knew this was gonna happen. We knew that there would be a first wave and there would be a lull in the second wave. And we had talked about, you know, at national level, state levels, we need to use this time to plan. I'm not sure that that really happened. And so here we are in a second wave in Michigan and we can probably look forward to a third wave based on all the information coming out now that, that says that you know there are variants in coronavirus and we need to be thinking about uh, maybe a third wave because maybe the vaccines won't be as effective as they should be or maybe people that have had COVID already might not be as immune to the variants, okay? So we can, we can expect probably a third wave with this. Um, this is what's happened in Michigan, so I won't go through all of these, but the idea here is that uh, prior to our first cave, we, our first case in Michigan, we had the emergency operations center activated. We had our first case, colleges, universities, schools, bars, restaurants, they all closed down, had a mandatory stay at home order, uh, mandatory mask orders. Eventually things opened back up, say mid June or so, something like that. Uh, but then cases went right back up again. And uh, we had a pause right in November and closed restaurants and bars again to indoor dining. High schools were closed, uh, you know, theaters, bowling alley, all closed again. Um, and some of that stuff has been uh, starting to open up again. The important thing to think about here is that I, I don't think, you know, from a personal standpoint, I can't be responsible for somebody else's health, right? I, I can do what I can do for myself. But the idea behind some of these closures and, and all of this is that we also need to be protective of the health infrastructure that we have in the state and in the country. And so when we closed down again, very shortly thereafter, we had 18 hospital systems in the state that were in 90% capacity and six that were 100% capacity. The risk of overwhelming the health system because of this was very, very high. And so um, really breaking the system. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, from a from a state administration standpoint, I think that they think of these things, right? They have to be able to think in those contexts. Um, so restaurants have reopened in the last few weeks. We have capacity restrictions, but we can go out and, you know, have a dinner someplace. Um, by February 16th, Approximately 20% of Michigan residents have received at least one dose of, uh, of a COVID-19 vaccine. So <clears throat> that is also starting to roll out. So social determinants of health. Um, I'll, I, I'll admit, you know, 15 years ago, I hadn't really thought about this. It hadn't been something that even occurred to me, right? That, that this is something that, uh, you know, could impact health. I mean, I, I knew a little bit about it, but as I learn more about it, think more about it, uh, do more research about it, what I really find is that, oh my gosh, these things are huge. And so when we talk about social determinants of health, the definition from CDC, I think, or NIH, is that these are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, as well as the complex interrelated social structures and economic systems that shape these conditions. And so we're really talking about things like social and community context, economic stability, education, healthcare, neighborhoods, right? These are all important things. Um, there's really good research. I mean, I've seen ranges, but around 80% of health outcomes are dictated by social determinants of health. I've seen 60%, I've seen seven, you know, it's a pretty high number. Modifiable factors, our own personal behaviors, you know, medications we take, all that sort of stuff accounts for only about 10 to 20%. So the idea here is not that, you know, we don't have some control over our, our health and, and what we do and what we choose to do, but a lot of it is the institutions and the systems that we are immersed in that have an influence on, on our health outcomes. So let me give you an example. And this is just one. Um, if you're at all curious, you can easily find much more about this anywhere. Uh, let's think about neighborhood, right? So 
In the early 1900s, when uh, housing was being developed in the city of Flint and neighborhoods were being developed, and right up until the 1950s, um, at the time, uh, the city of Flint, General Motors, uh, mortgage companies, banking companies, they developed policies that would allow certain groups of people to settle in certain parts of town, right? And so uh, we have automatically a housing system that's set up that is beneficial to some while not being beneficial to others. Uh, so in neighborhoods that were rated like where highly professional people lived or they had good infrastructure, good streets, good houses, mortgage lending companies would only lend to white people to live in those neighborhoods. Conversely, in neighborhoods with bad water infrastructure, uh, bad sewage treatments, uh, you know, bad roads, older housing, they would only lend to black and brown folks to live in those areas. If you tried to live in another area and you were a black and brown person, you weren't gonna get a mortgage, right? And so we set up systems where certain groups of people are only able to live in certain neighborhoods and those patterns of residence continue today, right? And so they live in older houses, they have poor infrastructure, uh, property values are low, which in turn impacts educational opportunities and funding for schools. So all of these in turn impact your ability to lead a healthy life and also access health systems and be able to pay for it and all of those. One example, another example, prison systems in this country were not meant to rehabilitate people. They were initially developed to catch runaway slaves, right? And so that's the basic foundational history of the prison system, the justice system in this country. And it lives on today. We see that black and brown folks who commit crimes, same crimes as white folks, are arrested and incarcerated more often. And they're incarcerated for longer. We know that exists. Uh, education systems could be separate, right? Separate but equal. Um, and so educational systems were not designed for the inclusion and success of black and brown folks. And so all of those things that happened, even though it happened 50, 100 years ago, and policies might have changed, the legacy still lives on. And so it creates a lack of access and it creates this, um, uh, this situation where people don't have the same access to care, access to healthcare, use of healthcare, and trust in the healthcare system. Okay. So that's what we mean by social determinants of health. And they do have an impact. So those are things we need to consider. So let's think about Michigan. I just mentioned a bunch of those things. Um, household pulse survey uh, done by the census, and I've got to look at time here. I'll get moving. Um, when we look at employment, right, 52% of people have reported a loss of employment income. 34% uh, of people expect a loss of income. Um, issues with obtaining food. And we can look at Detroit and other urban areas that are largely African American, and we can see that more people there are looking at things like reporting delaying medical care housing insecurity, difficulties with education, that type of stuff. It's happening everywhere. So these are social determinants that we expect are going to impact people even after the pandemic ends, okay? These will continue to live on. Um, let's look at chronic conditions, okay? And so one of the things with chronic conditions is that in general, what we find is that for black and brown people, they have higher rates of mortality from different conditions and higher, higher prevalence of certain conditions. And so we can see here that for diabetes, heart disease and chronic kidney disease, that the rate of the mortality rates for blacks are higher than they are for whites, right? For COPD, it's a different story. Whites die at higher rates than do blacks. But the idea behind this information is that it's really important to think about who are the essential workers. And in this state and mostly throughout the country, we have about 50 to 70% of black and brown folks that are filling um, essential jobs, meaning they're public facing and they're exposed on a daily basis. And it just so happens that these same people have higher incidences of chronic disease that place them at risk for death from COVID-19. So we're placing people out into the communities to be exposed, to get infected, to die, right? There's no disputing this. This is what has happened. And we see it really in the early days of the pandemic in Michigan. So I wanna be clear that race is not a determinant of health. It's not race that we're talking about, it's racism. And I say that word and I can see eyes roll and I can hear people like clenching and I can just see it, right? Even though I can't see all of you, 
I don't mean individual racism. I'm not so naive to say that racism doesn't exist. It does. Some people are racist, right? We all have our own biases. I get that. I'm not calling, I'm not calling individual people racist. But just as I described for the social determinants of health, we embed people in institutions and systems that were developed using racist policies. These are racist institutions and we need to correct them, right? And so essential workers, we're sending people out to work to be exposed that are automatically at increased risk. We need to work on that. And so some of the things we've done actually at the state level are pretty good. I shouldn't say we, because I have had nothing to do with it. Um, but um, what we found in July of 2020 is that we can see, look at this, a lot more white people are dying than black people. Well, that's true, all right? We have more white people in the state than we do black people. And so we need to look at the rates, right, of disease. So these are cases. And so what we found at the beginning of the pandemic in July, let me get my notes here, is that we had about um, 16,000 cases per million people in black folks. And we had about 4,000 cases per million in white folks. So we have a case ratio of four to one black to white. Doesn't make any sense, why is that happening? We move on through into February. And what we find is that our case ratios, our um, cases per million have really evened out. They're about one to one. And there's been a lot of work done by um, uh, a task force, Michigan coronavirus disparities. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, task force on racial disparities, excuse me. And so they've been studying how to remove barriers to care, to testing, how to make people uh, better protected at work all those sorts of things. And so what we've seen is we've had a good decrease, right? We've sort of evened it out. We we're seeing one-to-one, -one, which is good. We still don't want people to be infected, but um, some of those things have been removed and we're seeing that there's not such a disparate impact. Now we can look at deaths too, and I won't go over the numbers, but at the beginning of the pandemic in July, again, we have about 1600 cases of deaths um, in African-Americans per million and we have about 400 white in whites. So about four to one again, four deaths in blacks compared to one death in whites. And what we've seen as the pandemic has gone on is that this has changed to about two to one. So it's gotten better, but blacks are still dying at two times the rate of whites, right? So we still have an issue to work on. Um, and as we continue to work on things, uh, it, you know, things will probably even out. They've done a really great job at that, at, with that commission um, to, to really look and study at some of these issues and, and, and uh, start uh, uh, helping people out when they need it. Um, we've started recently reporting race level or race data for vaccines. And this just came out two days ago. So it's really incomplete as we start, but anecdotally what we're finding is that um, more whites are getting vaccines than blacks and people of color. Uh, there's a large number of uh, unknown races. So about 44% of race data is unknown. People haven't reported it. And so as that gets better, as we find that information, we'll be able to figure out whether there are true disparities uh, between groups as to whether there's equitable access to the vaccine. But this is just at the beginning. I wanted to throw it on there, um, mostly to say that we've just started reporting and collecting this information. All right, almost done, a few more. So what can, what can we expect in the future? Well, I alluded to life expectancy earlier, right? So with um, uh, Spanish flu reduced by about 12 years, uh, you know, during the pandemic. Uh, right now, within the first six months of the pandemic, when they've done life expectancy tables, uh, what we find is that life expectancy has reduced by about 1.1 years. But for non-Hispanic Blacks, it's reduced by about two for Hispanics by about three, and for white people by about 0.68. So the impact of life expectancy, again, not equal, right? Um, Hispanics had a, had a life expectancy much more than whites for, for quite a while. And what we can see right now is that it's about at the same level. So um, they've had you know some, some sort of thing happen, right? Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is whether people get the care that they need and so what can we expect with chronic conditions? And I just wanna highlight a few things here. So if you see a number that's less than one, um, that's a good thing. If you see a number that's greater than one, that's a bad thing. And the thing I wanna point out is that what we have found with females is that during the pandemic, they were less likely to um, report being unable to get an ongoing or get treatment for an ongoing condition. But as the pandemic went on, they were more likely. So about 14% more likely. Same thing to get regular checkups. They were in a better position before or when the pandemic started, but now they're worse. We can look at people of different races. 
non-Hispanic Blacks, they were in better positions before, but they were in worse positions later, right? Same thing goes on. All, all increasing um, lack of access to care. Why is this important? Because when you have chronic conditions and you don't get a checkup, you can't go to the doctor, it's gonna get worse, right? So this is a big issue that we need to take care of is, you know, a year into the pandemic, we should have been able to figure out how to get people the care that they needed. We haven't seemed to have been able to do that. So either offices aren't open, people don't feel comfortable coming in, or physicians are saying, yeah, don't come in, we can wait on that. Um, but what it ends up doing is probably killing people and reducing life expectancy. Okay, so as the pandemic goes on, there'll be another one of these surveys that goes out um, probably in winter. I'll be able to look at the data a little bit more, uh, but hopefully we're getting better at providing care for people um, who need it. All right, mental health. So short term, we know for sure people are depressed, they're anxious, they're lonely. Um, there's been an increase in suicide attempts. There's a really great project um, out through Canada. I normally don't praise Canada for much, but you know, they're doing good here. Um, they're looking at depression and they're looking at peer reviewed studies that are happening all over the place. And here's what they found. Everyone's in bad shape, right? So university students, general public, rare and serious diseases, healthcare workers, people who are younger, people who are older, they had young children, they had risk factors. Everybody is anxious, depressed, can't sleep, they're distressed, we have to figure this out too, right? So there's this real, real danger in shutting down and staying home and not um, socially interacting with people. I'm an introvert, I can stay home all day, but even I need people, you know? You need to have that. And so this is a huge, huge impact on mental health. And so how long this lasts after we've figured out the pandemic is anybody's guess. Unemployment. Big problem. So early days of the pandemic, we had unemployment in Michigan that was it increased what happened during the Great Depression. We bounced back some, but pre-pandemic, we were about 3.8% for unemployment. We're still double that, right? So we still have work to do as things open up. Maybe that'll get better. Hopefully it will. 33% um, of the state's population has uh, received unemployment benefits within the last year, totaling about $28.2 billion. Some of it federal money, some of it state money. We expect that to continue. Child health, big thing, right? So if schools are closed, they're usually the front line for reporting things like physical and sexual abuse. Meals are provided in schools. So 600,000 new kids in Michigan needed food assistance within the last eight, nine months. Um, they added 600,000 more people to uh, people that were food insecure and most of them were children. ACEs. These are called ad or adverse childhood experiences. We know children that experience trauma and um, terrible situations earlier in their life. It affects their health later in life. But we're going to need to see what happens. CDC just today. So I was saying earlier, it's so hard to do these presentations because information changes on a daily basis. But just today, um, we found out that uh, racial and ethnic minority children are worse off related to COVID. 26.9% of childhood cases are from Latino children and 25.3% of deaths, way more than their representation in the population. Black children account for about 12%, 11, 12%, and 16% of deaths. And the most severe syndrome related to COVID in kids, 69% of cases are Hispanic or Black. It's a huge issue. This is not going away, right? So to close, what did I say about Spanish flu? We know, we know what's gonna happen. This is not conjecture. Lower educational attainment, more disability, more health problems, lower income, lower SES. We know what happened. And so we need to take this time to plan for what's gonna to happen to this cohort of kids in the next 60 years, because they're going to look different than, than I look in my cohort or my parents look or even my kids, right? This is gonna be a big issue and we need to start planning for it right now. So, um, Really great things about COVID. Sorry to have depressed all of you, um, but you know, there's hope on the horizon. Things are starting to look up here and there and uh, that's where we are. So thank you. Um, I've got a ton of references here, which I've been assured that people can access if they want to. They're, they're, this will be on YouTube later. And uh, you know, you can look at resources if you want to. You can, you can reach out if you need to, to, to ask me more questions. But I'm happy to answer questions right now um, if we have some time. I know I went a little bit over, we started a little bit late, but if we've got a couple, I'm more than happy to, to answer. Okay, well, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So 
We do have a few, and um, if people need to leave, they'll they'll just have to bow out. But I'll go I'll go through them. I'm going to put the first couple together. One is just a quick question about what difference between epidemic and pandemic, okay. and then a question about the aerosol spread. Um, that was that was that information withheld um, from people early on in the interest of conserving masks. Those are really good questions. So epidemic, pandemic, pandemic, it, it really is, um, uh, the, the terms are used considering the level of spread. So pandemic is global, community spread, all that sort of stuff. Epidemic uh, could be global, but it might be more limited sort of spread and, and, and that type of stuff. So it's just a different level of sort of looking at, at how far it's gone. As far as withholding information about aerosol spread, um, I, I would like to say that I could speak really intelligently about that. Um, I know that in the early days, right, there's all sorts of, of, of conjecture about how this is spread. And at first was wipe down every surface you touch, right? And then it was don't get too close to people. Um, is, it, is it from droplets? Is it from aerosols? What's it from? And um, I, I, I can't speak specifically to all the science and the research that has gone on be, behind all of that. But I think that as time has gone on, we've gotten in a, a better place to say that, it, it, that, that aerosols can spread it. I don't, my personal opinion is that I don't think that in the early days that information was withheld so that we could, you know, conserve masks. I think that there just wasn't enough evidence to suggest the exact way that it was spread. I don't think it was anything so nefarious to say, you can't have a mask, we're going to save it for everybody else. I, I think it was just a lack of information. Yeah, that's my opinion. Okay. Um, okay. Do you suspect COVID vaccinations will become an annual thing like flu vaccines? So I, I, again, I'll preface this with I'm, I'm not an immunologist. I, I'm not a vaccinologist. I'm not any of that. But a lot of the stuff that I've read has said that it's possible that yes, this will become endemic. Uh, meaning that it's always going to be around. Same with the flu, right? So these are endemic. We're always going to have them. Um, and the way we deal with the flu virus is to have different um, strains of it in the, in the flu vaccine every year. There is some uh, discussion that says that it might not be any different for COVID. Um, but we're a year into this, and I don't think we really know yet. We know that um, there have been mutations in the virus, and so there are variants. And so it's possible that, yeah, this could be endemic and we could have, we could need boosters as time goes on yeah, for okay. people that are willing to get the vaccine. There's a couple about, um, you know, is the US doing as poorly as the media reports? Because you mentioned the 4% of the population, but 25% of the cases. Uh, is, it, is it possible that other portions of the world are not reporting as, as accurately or that they're under-reporting the cases? Sure. Sure, it's, it's definitely possible. I can't say that I know for sure how every country in the world reports. Um, I, I can probably say with pretty good certainty and you know, there's probably not a lot of people that would disagree, but I, I think that the conjecture out there now is that China has vastly underreported the number of cases. Um, it could be that cases are reported differently based on different criteria. We know that that happens for other public health measures um, compared between the US and other countries. Um, so, so there's a possibility, but I guess from a perspective of the data and a public health perspective, we have to go with what we have, right? We know that in the US, there are 28 million cases or whatever it is. Um, there's really some conjecture that that's probably underreported, right? Or under identified, because not everybody goes to get tested, not everybody reports the result, there's all those things. So. Um, I, I don't know how to address that with what's going on in other parts of the world, other than to say, sure, it's a possibility. Yeah. Well, what about, um, this one's kind of related, and I think we'll have this one and one more question after this. Um, okay. But the, the, the maybe some of the COVID deaths, the persons had other conditions that was what they were really suffering with, but it was documented as a COVID death. Sure. Um, possibly to get additional funding or something. Could you speak to the validity of those? Sure. So I can speak to it a little bit. Um, so COVID can hasten death for people that have comorbid conditions. There's no doubt about that. Um, how it's reported 
is, I think, sort of up for debate at times, right? So it could be reported that somebody has the congestive heart failure and they have COVID. Do they report congestive heart failure as a cause of death? Do they report COVID? Now, my understanding is that there were lots of debates about that in the early days, but the, it's largely been settled. So if you have a chronic condition that you've lived with for a long time, but it's been um, exacerbated by COVID, COVID could be considered the cause of death, right, I, I, officially. Now, my understanding about extra money for a COVID diagnosis, um, I think that my understanding is that there are enhanced reimbursements to take care of um, conditions and materials and equipment and supplies that weren't really considered before. But my understanding also is that it's sort of reimbursed at the normal rate of reimbursement that you would get for another infectious disease, right? Yeah. There, there's no difference. It's just they had to figure out how to reimburse for COVID care. It hadn't existed before. So now they're reimbursing for it. And I think that there's some, um, I think that there's some, some initial worry that they were giving you more money if you diagnosed somebody with COVID. No, they were just reimbursing for standard care. Okay, yeah, thank you. And then, That's my uh, understanding. Last, yeah, thank you. I guess this will have to be our last question. And um, okay. it's, it's a, an important one about the ratio of, of brown and black people being more highly affected by COVID. The question is, you know, how do you think we could fix or present, prevent this from happening in the future? And so did you have a few thoughts that maybe some things we could work on? Oh my gosh, I have so many thoughts. Um, yeah. Uh, but you know, well, I mean, that's that's the that's the bazillion dollar question, right? Yeah. Um, we've known that we've had these issues for years and years and years and years. And so what is it that's gonna get us there to motivate us to make changes that we need? I wish I knew the answer to that. I, I really do. And you know, there's been a lot of thought right now that everything that's happened in the last year, maybe that'll be the motivating factor. And that would be great. But yeah. boy, for as long as as long as we've we've had this in this country, it, it it's been an issue. So I wish I knew how to address it. I know, yeah, thank you. I think I think also with the kind of work that you're doing could be and just getting the data out there and showing people could also help with the, the sort of surge in concern that's arisen this year for sure. um, the, the issues related to, to racism and yeah and and health. So um, I think I, I think data has a, a part in that data has a really good part to play in that. But I think that eventually you got to use that data to make decisions about what are we going to do, right? Yeah. I, I love my numbers. You give me a set of data, I'll play with it all day long. Um, but it's it's then that next step. What do we do with that? What do we what recommendations do we make based on that? So yeah. really that's where we go from here. Yeah. Well, I think on that note, then we'll we'll have to close. I wish we could spend longer, but thank you so much for a very, very interesting and enlightening talk and very interesting in terms of the history and what we can learn to help us project and hopefully do better in the future. That's what we yeah, hope yeah. can help us. Thanks. With. I had a great time. I love doing it. So thank you so much. And it's really nice to get the chance to be with you. And there are very you. number of favorable comments in the <laughs> Q&A too. So. Oh, good. Thanks. All righty. Okay. Thank All right. you. Thank you.